I have good news for you today. It's saving faith. Saving faith lives. Saving faith gives. Saving faith lives. Saving faith gives. And saving faith loves. Not just a little. Saving faith loves much. Saving faith bears fruit. It's kind of a preview of what we're going to be learning today from God's Word. Saving faith bears fruit. Not only this Sunday, but the next couple Sundays as we move through Luke chapter 8. Saved people are fruitful and multiply. In the beginning, when God created human beings in God's image, the creation covenant ordinance is that uh, human beings would be fruitful and multiply. What does that mean? Well, as we come to the New Testament, we see that's not just a biological related command. That is a spiritually kingdom of God related command. Saving faith bears fruit. Saved people are fruitful and multiply. Those who truly believe in Jesus and therefore live in him and in his word are fruitful and multiply. If you're saved, you're going to be fruitful and multiply. In other words, other people are going to come to know Jesus and come into the kingdom through you, through your witness, through your stewardship, through your outreach, through your giving, through your commitment to the body of Christ. People whom Jesus saves, and how does he save? We saw this clarified in Luke chapter 7. Go back to the last several sermons from September. Jesus saves people by grace through faith. Not just Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, but also all the way through Luke chapter 7. By grace through faith. Well, if we're saved by grace through faith, then we are, in turn, this is guaranteed, because it's our Savior and the way we're saved. If we're saved by grace, that means generosity, overflowing generosity, not tit for tat. I mean, generosity, grace. We're saved by grace through faith and faithfulness, then we will be people of generosity and faithfulness to God and to others, full of grace and faith. Christians love him generously and powerfully. That's the way it is in our relationship with God, with the Lord Jesus. Jesus' kingdom people don't just recite the Shema. I'll come back to what that means if you don't know what that means. Don't just recite the Shema in words, but in a living testimony. They, they love not just with their words, but with their lives. Jesus' people love God with undivided hearts and souls and means or giving. Children of God love much. And that's our sermon title for today. Love much. It's a command, it's a way of being a Christian, and it's an invitation. Love much. We're going to turn to two passages of Scripture. We're back to Luke's Gospel primarily after kind of a last Sunday dealing with the situation in Israel and thinking across time about God's providence in the midst of that. We're back to Luke today. But first, I'm going to read to you the opening lines of what's called the Shema in the Old Testament. That, that title comes from the opening Hebrew command, Shema Israel. That means, hear Israel. It's a command. Hear, O Israel. Adonai Elheinu, Adonai Echad. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. So, Let's listen to this now. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, or the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You could translate the, the Lord only. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might or your means. I'll come back to that. And then, picking back up in what we're reading through and preaching through in Luke's gospel, we are today to Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Hear now God's word. 
And it happened soon afterwards. He was going through town and village, preaching and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's household manager. Susanna, and many others, in other words, many other women, who were providing for them out of their own means. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Love much. Jews for thousands of years, faithful Jews, have recited what's called the Shema, uh, morning and evening, every day, every day. Now, there are several passages of scripture that comprise the Kiryat uh, Shema from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and then over to Deuteronomy 11, and then back to Numbers 15. But the beginning verses are the signature verses of the Shema and the core of the covenant. Jesus says, if you want to know everything about the Old Testament and everything about what God calls forth from his people, you have to go here. Here is the first and the greatest commandment, Jesus says, to hear, O Israel, that your Lord is the one God, okay? And then to love him with all your heart and all your soul and all your resources, all your might, all your strength. It's a core covenant commandment. It's the heart of the covenant, Jesus says, with God. The opening verse, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, affirms, and for the Jews, it is a confession of faith, that the Lord God, that is the covenant God of Israel, Yahweh, Jehovah, is, is the God, that he is, first of all, sovereign, and second of all, singular. He is the one God, Lord over heaven and earth. He is the one God, and he is sovereign over all. And I'm called to bow before him to worship him, to give my life to him. That's what Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 is about. No other gods. In other words, back to the first commandment, the Ten Commandments, but even more than that. Okay? That's Deuteronomy 6, 4, sovereign and singular. And the second verse of the key opening of the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, is a command to give him your singular and undivided love. In other words, he as God is singular and undivided, and we are called to give him singular and undivided hearts, souls, and means. Singular and undivided. That means always, across all time. That means for better or for worse, in sickness and in health in joy and in sorrow. I don't just obey God and love God and give him my all when he seems to be doing what I tell him to do and want him to do. See, I'm called to love him with all my heart all the time, across all time, through all the ups and downs of my life. That's the Shema. Jesus says this is the heart of what the Bible has to teach us about a relationship with God. Love him all the time with everything we are undividedly. And that includes with my whole might and my means. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall, it's second person singular here. God gets really personal about this, both with respect to the people of Israel, you know, Israel, but also with respect to you and me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your ma'od. With all your ma'od. Now, bear with me, because i got to teach you this, because you're going to need to understand this as we move back to Luke. Okay. Ma'od, the Hebrew there, 
you know, that's typically translated might or strength. It's not the Hebrew word for might or strength. There are other Hebrew words for might or strength. Gevurah, Hezkah. Those are other Hebrew words that mean like strong, strong horses, strong armies, that kind of thing, okay? That's not what we're talking about here. Ma'ob, it's different. It means muchness. Literally, it means muchness. Let me explain. It is an adverb that is sometimes used adjectivally as well to intensify things that happen or descriptors in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament. So, let me tell you the first time we see this. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. First time we get my old, okay? And God has, in the creation, has given six blessings. And you know this, right? I've been teaching you this. If we have six, what do we expect from God? And what's the big deal? Number seven. We really need to pay attention to number seven. So the seventh blessing, which we read in Genesis 1.31, after the creation of human beings in God's image, God this time sees it and says it's tov, that means good, ma'ol, very good, much good. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's Genesis 1.31, much good, okay? Now let me give you another example when we see this in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 43, uh, the Bible is talking about how rich Jacob has become. And so it says that the man increased or, or became prosperous. Ma'od, ma'od, it uses it twice there to tell us this guy is seriously rich now. He is much rich now. In other words, he's filled with prosperity. By the way, God's going to call him to give back <laughs> to him out of that muchness. So, to the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your ma'od, all your muchness, your resources, your means. I need you to remember that because that's going to help you understand what is going on with Jesus and his ministry where we are right now in Luke and what he's teaching then and now to you and me. But first of all, uh, all of us may be a little bit of a cold shower here, and to those of us who are female among us, you need to pay attention to this. This is going to be a little bit bothersome for a moment, so just hang with me. In classical rabbinic rules, per the Mishnah, this compiles orthodox rabbinic teaching from the New Testament period, roughly speaking, kind of, intertestamental rolling through New Testament times and a little bit after New Testament times and per the Talmud, which further elaborates on Mishnah, uh, in both the Mishnah and the Talmud, let me tell you who's not required to recite the Shema. All those verses that I just told you about from Deuteronomy 6, 11, Numbers. Uh, slaves, women, and minors. Slaves, women, and minors are not sons of the covenant, and under uh, Mishnaic and Talmudic teaching, they do not recite the Shema. They're exempt from Kiryat, from calling out Shema. Also, Gentiles, obviously, because they're not under the covenant yet. If they're circumcised and under the covenant, they're no longer Gentiles out there. But let's now turn back to Jesus and his revolutionary New Testament teaching about bringing everyone who is saved by faith into his kingdom and into covenant with God. In Jesus' beloved family, he's totally focused on, he doesn't care if you're a man or a woman, if you're rich or poor, if you're Asian, African, North American, South American, it does, hearers and doers hearers and doers of God's word. Jesus starts pounding this theme of hearing and then doing. And what does that take us back to? The Shema, right? Which Jesus says is the center of everything. It's like Grand Central Station to understanding the entire Hebrew scriptures. Jesus says, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people who will hear Shema, right? Hear 
and flowing from that, do. In other words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and means. And in the New Testament, in this community that Jesus is developing, it's just radical. I mean, yes, it's all men who are the apostles. Yes, it's all men who are going to preach uh, to, to Israel and out to the nations. Yes, but this community is exemplified by women who under rabbinical, classical rabbinic teaching are not to recite, not required to recite, not expected to recite Shema, but they're actually going to live the Shema. And who thus, then and forever, live eternally in God's kingdom. So, in fact, women who loved much. So, here's what they do. As we learn from Luke 8, 1 through 3. They remember their past. They give fully their presence and their partnership into the church, into the kingdom ministry. And they persevered in that faithfulness and that love for Jesus to profess who he is as Lord and Savior. So let's learn about this. Jesus' beloved family, hearers and doers of God's word. Where is Martin just kind of making up that theme? No, it's running all the way through here. Let me give you a key verse. We are heading to this key verse over the next couple weeks or so. Luke chapter 8, verse 21. I'll come back to this, but this is a framing verse for this segment of Luke we're in. Luke 8, 21. The people have come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, look, your mother and your brothers are outside. They want to talk to you. And Jesus responds and says this, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Okay? Oh, they actually hear it and they do it. That's what my real family is like, Jesus says. I'm forming a new family that's going to call on God in prayer as our Father in heaven. So we're talking about Jesus' beloved Koinonia, this is a Greek term that means like communion. This is a term that's used in the New Testament. Jesus' beloved koinonia family, not biological family, koinonia family, kingdom family of hearers and doers. And this is exemplified by women who loved much with all their hearts, souls, and their, yes, their means. Okay, so Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, what we're focusing on today Jesus begins cycle two, what I would refer to as cycle two of his itinerant ministry in Galilee. He's proclaiming the kingdom gospel, mainly in Galilee. He's going to move out, but he's mainly in Galilee once again. Take you back to the prelude to and the beginning of cycle one in Luke's gospel of Jesus's Galilean public ministry. It starts in Luke 4, 14 through 16. He's, you know, preaching and People are amazed, and he's doing miracles. And then it rolls through his big occasion in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth, and his key sermon there, that he is the fulfillment of Isaiah 61 and basically the entire messianic prophecy of the Old Testament. And he's bringing in the Jubilee year. And then you kind of come out of that. Jesus starts preaching and ministering out of Capernaum, and the people in Capernaum want Jesus to just stay there forever. We'll build a big building. Everybody will come to us. You're safe here in Capernaum. Just hang out, Jesus. And Jesus says no. And he says this in Luke 4, 43, which really launches him in full scale into cycle one of his itinerant ministry. He says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well because that is why I was sent. Why is Jesus here? Why was Jesus born? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Because Jesus has come to preach the kingdom of God. That's, that's what he's telling us. Now then, as I said, this new segment gets marked off with Luke 8, 1 through 3. Kai Agenito, you already know that if you've been with me in any Luke, because I've been highlighting this term a lot. Luke likes this term a lot. And it came to pass, and it happened. So we've got a marker here, and then what are we heading into? He was going through town and village. That's kind of a Greek idiom. It means... Uh, and, and, and the town could be city, but it's, it means city polis, but it, he's going through a lot of towns and villages, but it's just kind of an idiom in singular there. He was going through town and village, preaching and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And who's with him? 
Well, we expect this, right? The 12, those whom he set apart as his apostles. You know, Simon, Andrew, James, John, those guys. But also notice this, also certain women who had been healed. So Jesus now, and this is different. You can look at, go back and look at Luke 4.43. Now he is not only proclaiming or preaching the kingdom gospel, he's bringing it. He's bringing the kingdom gospel. And the word there means he's evangelizing with like a presence, okay? So in other words, Jesus is not just preaching. He now has a community around him. Do you see what's happened from cycle one to cycle two? He now has this developing church, so to speak, or church in the making with his apostles. And also, this is kind of crazy, but I mean, most Jews, are like all these women with him too. So um, notice this. He is bringing the kingdom in koinonia as well as preaching it in word. That's a new development now. We're at a different stage of his ministry. So let's look at where we're going to be the next couple of weeks. First of all, of course, we've opened with 8, 1 through 3. Jesus preaches and brings the kingdom gospel. The middle part, kind of the central meat, 8, 4 through 18. He's going to give two parables, a big one about the soils and the word of God, and then a smaller one too, and he's going to teach about why he uses parables and what they mean. That's 8, 4 through 18. And then finally, back to what we've already highlighted, the other framer for this little subsection, 8, 19 through 21, he says, my family, my mothers and brothers are those who hear and do the word of God. Okay, so here we are back at the beginning of this cycle, Jesus preaching and bringing the gospel of the kingdom, mainly in Galilee, central to his bringing the gospel, his beloved Koinonia family of new heart, new heart, Believers. So let's look at how this section starts. The opening part of verse 1. And it happened soon afterwards. Now, if you're using your brain and paying attention and not distracted by your cell phone right now, you're supposed to immediately ask this question, Christian. Soon after what, right? He's got to like read the Bible. Okay. Soon after what? Well, we're supposed to go back and remember, oh yeah, so this flows out of Chapter 7, talking about salvation by grace through faith, which is ultimately climaxed in Jesus' encounter with Simon, the Pharisee, in the big shot Simon's house when Simon throws a banquet. Go back to the sermon from two weeks ago, you know, okay, from October the, the, the 8th, and a sinful woman who comes and cries all over Jesus, you know, covers his feet with her tears, is kissing Jesus' feet, lavishly pours out this uh, anointing ointment on his feet or oil on his feet. So, and in the, in the heart of that message, Jesus says this to Simon. After telling the parable of the debtors, the two debtors, Jesus is saying, Simon, you don't understand this, but you're a sinner too. You totally need to be saved. Now, let me ask you this. Now, let me tell you this. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For as evidence of it, she has loved much. Did you catch it now? What does ma'od mean in the Shema, literally? Much. This is a conversation about actually living out the Shema. Do you catch what Jesus is teaching here? These are all Jewish people. They, they, Simon is a Pharisee. He knows the law. He knows the word. Okay, so moving ahead. These people, these apostles and these women are with Jesus, the 12 and also women who had been what? Let's fill in the blank here. This is my one blank for you today. Women who had been the best Sunday school teachers ever for their entire lives. Women who had been the homecoming queen. Women who, had, uh, who were just the high society of everybody and everybody thought they were perfect and were jealous of them their entire lives. Is that what we fill in this blank with? The choir directors, the children's choir director. Is that what we fill in this? Women who had been, not the choir director, sorry, Craig, it doesn't get filled in this way, but women who had been healed of <gasps> evil spirits. It's one of Luke's ways of saying demons and sicknesses. If you want to sum this up, this is women with a past. Now, we all have a past, but you all know some women with a past. These are women with a past. Mary, 
called Magdalene, from whom seven demons. Hey, the devil can count too. When he wants full control of every, you remember about seven, right? When the devil is saying, this is my woman. She belongs to me. I have her for now and eternity. She's full of seven demons. And what is Jesus saying? No, she does not belong to you, Satan. I will deliver her from all seven. Not a one of them stays in her. You understand, this is the, the conflict. Jesus has come in preaching the kingdom. Jesus is preaching, this is not devil's territory, and you're not devil's territory. You belong to me. That's what's, that's what's happened with this woman. Not only has she been healed, Jesus has claimed her for his kingdom over Satan's kingdom. That's implicit in all of this, okay? Then also, let's notice we go a little bit much higher society, actually, much higher political power. Joanna, wife of Cusa. Herod, that means Herod the Tetrarch. You know, the guy who's arrested John and everything? That guy's household manager. You want to talk about inside reach of Jesus' ministry? <laughs> this woman, who's, who, who's the wife of the guy who runs Herod's household? Is apparently his, some kind of financial advisor too, probably. <laughs> She's been healed somehow. Luke is a little vague on, you know, we know Mary Magdalene's delivered from demons. Don't know about Joanna, maybe, maybe just sicknesses. Uh, um, Joanna, Susanna, only time she's mentioned in the New Testament. She gets once in there, okay? And notice this, many others, not three, but lots of these women who've been healed and delivered from demons and healed of sicknesses. And what do they do? They go back to their homes and say, Thank you, Jesus. If I ever need you again, I'll touch the TV when you're on the TV and pray about, you know, being healed or something like that. No, no, no. They're following Jesus. They're with Jesus. And they provided for them out of their means. In other words, they are financing Jesus' ministry. These women, you remember this, Jesus has no property, no finances of his own. That's specifically the way he comes. I, I don't have a place to lay my head. God is going to provide it all, and God provides it in part through these women. They love much, and we're called to love much with all my past, all my presence. Yes, that's a play on present, but my actually being with Jesus, partnership and perseverance. Now, let's look at what this means. Number one, I need to, and I'm called to, remember my past. Now, remember my past not in self-hating guilt. This is not a guilt trip but in loving gratitude for Jesus' saving grace. Mary called Magdalene. I've talked about her. Seven, <laughs> seven evil spirits have gone out. And as I said, this clarifies and testifies to Jesus' power over the devil and over the devil's kingdom. And you could say to me, though, i got to pause here, because some of us are going to be saying, hey, Pastor, I, I understand about Mary, but like, I, I've been in church my whole life. I've never been demonically possessed. Anybody want to go ahead and testify to being demonically possessed? Probably not all of us have been demonically possessed. Some of us actually were the Sunday school teacher and the children's choir director most of our life, right? And so you could say, well, I get this about Jesus saying Mary Magdalene, but what does this have to do with me? Uh, well, everything. You remember, speaking of the Old Testament, every single Jew is supposed to say, we were slaves in Egypt, and God delivered us. Not just the generation that gets delivered out. If I'm a Jew, that's my story. I was a slave, and God had to save me. Okay? As Christians, we're called to know that we, not just Mary Magdalene, but we were dead in sin. I don't care if you grew up in the church. You were dead in sin, and Jesus has saved you totally, totally. Again, now, we're going to get to the parable of the soils uh, next week, but let me just go ahead and tell you some of the, the problems that Jesus says about people who actually, in other words, like, hear and do the word. Jesus brings up Satan or the devil who distracts. By the way, does Satan ever distract you? Are you totally focused on God all the time? Anybody here want to go ahead and testify? Man, I'm, I'm with Jesus like every single moment I ever live. I'm totally focused on him. Or are you distracted sometimes? Well, the devil can distract you. And then Jesus goes on and says, the cares and worries and pleasures of the world. Anybody want to confess on that? I'm, I, I need to confess on that. The cares and 
worries of the world? Wait a minute, this is sounding a lot more relatable than I thought it was at first. Okay, and, and, and then um, what about shallow faith? Anybody ever deal with shallow faith? You're not really that deep in you. Okay, so we'll, we'll see this next week, but all of this, remembering my past, relates to me and to you, not just Mary Magdalene. Let's go to number two. Love him fully with my presence. He calls me to love him by being with him. Being with him. Living my life with him. <laughs> Brother Lawrence, in the practice of the presence of God, says this. This is just amazing grace. This king, far from chastising me, lovingly embraces me, makes me eat at his table, serves me. This is amazing. This is the king of the universe. Serves me with his own hands. This is Jesus now. I mean, the king of the universe. This is awesome. Will you come and have dinner with him? Are, are you having dinner? Are your children having dinner with Jesus every night? Are you too rushed? Are you too distracted by the cares and pleasures and worries of this world? He's inviting you to live your life in his presence and for you to be present with him. Love him fully with my presence, regardless of others' opinions and hostilities. I have to tell you, the world is increasingly right on out front against what Jesus has to teach about life, about priorities, about sexuality, about marriage, about faith, about the Lord is one, the Lord only, and also about your money. But to be with him means to stay with him through thick and thin, regardless of the way the world is going and regardless of what your friends say and regardless of what the media says. Third, love him fully with my financial partnership. They, notice this, provided for him. Literally, it means they, they ministered to him by their means. In other words, by financial means. And, and notice it provided for them. This means not just Jesus. Well, I like Jesus, but I don't like the church. No, no, no. You're talking about the church here. For them. This means Jesus the apostles and the other disciples, they are financing, they are giving to the church for its kingdom ministry as Jesus develops the koinonia, the church communion here. People whom Jesus saves will be generous and gracious, guarantee. If you're with Jesus, you're gonna be generous with your means. And fourth, persevere in love through trials to profess him publicly as Lord. As you and I think about what that means in our lives, let me just connect some dots here and give some amazing inspiration from God's word about these women. Uh, they're with him at Luke 8, 1 through 3, right? Phase 2 of his Galilee ministry, but they stayed with him. So let's go to the key points of the gospel axis. Jesus' crucifixion. Luke Chapter 23, verse 49. And all his acquaintances, Luke is vague on this. We don't know if this means kind of exclusive of several of the apostles or not, but clearly people who are befriending Jesus. And notice this. And the women who had followed him from Galilee. Do you see that? And the women who had followed him from Galilee connect the dot back to 8, verse 1 and 2 and 3. You know these women now. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been delivered. Joanna, wife of Cusa, Susanna, and many others. The women who had followed him from Galilee are the witnesses of his crucifixion and death on the cross. Do you see that? Now let's keep going. A few verses later, Luke 23, 55 and 56. Um, Joseph and Nicodemus are going to bury Jesus. The women who had come with him from Galilee, you know who these women are, followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. So in other words, what we profess and confess in the Apostles' Creed, these women are key witnesses. Do you understand what I'm saying? Was crucified, dead, and buried. Now let's go ahead to the resurrection. Chapter 24, verse 1 and 9 through 10, just skimming across here. But on the first day 
of the week at early dawn, they, who's they? The women who had followed him all the way from Galilee, all the way back to Luke chapter 8. They went to the tomb, taking spices they had prepared. It was, these are the key leaders, Mary Magdalene. Joanna, you know, who's she? Well, gosh, she's the wife of Cusa, Herod Antipas' household manager. There she is there, too. How are they paying for all these spices for, well, they're giving of their own means, right? Jesus didn't have a little side stash for this. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, mother of James, and several other women. And they're the ones who come back and tell what the angelic witness is. He's not here. He's risen. He's not dead. He's living. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's risen, just like he told you. So the women go back and tell the apostles. End of August, I preached one Sunday on the opening passage of Revelation chapter 2. Jesus' message to the angel of the church at Ephesus. And you remember our key call from Jesus. Verses 4 and 5. You have abandoned your first love. Remember from where you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at the first, Jesus says, to the church at Ephesus. And he says it to us too. He calls us to remember and to live in lavish love. Because that's the way we live in Christ Saved by grace, we are people of grace. So, saving faith lives, gives, and loves much. Love much. Let me, let you, love much. With all my past, all my presence, all my partnership, and all my perseverance, no matter what happens with me in this life, I'm with Jesus. I love him. Amen? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.